Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to miss it. What we're doing now is taking a non-magnetic closed loop tube, filling it with a permanently magnetized gas, and now accelerating the magnetized gas in such a way as its magnetic field will transfer the pickup coils, satisfying Maxwell and Faraday's law of electrical generation of passing of allowing the magnetic field to perform the work as it passes through the pickup coil. The energy input into the system is not to form the magnetic field. The only energy going into the system is to move the magnetic field, which you are not breaking. In order to accomplish the task, there was no form of generator possible to this date because there was no such thing as a magnetized gas that existed at room temperature. So we took the technology that we developed on the hydrogen gas gun to set up an environment by which we now ionize the gas ions and we have now taken atoms that normally do not link together, eject their electrons, and as a result force them to come together to form a gas lattice. Now this, the significance of this is that millions of new chemical compounds will come about now because we have a way of joining atoms that heretofore would not naturally join together. But this is an example of using argon atoms with iron ions or copper or, I mean, sorry, nickel or cobalt as an example, that those ions will exhibit this electrical magnetic field because their electron spins in the same directions. Argon, as an example, is ideally used because it is a gas, which is a lubricator, it does not like to transmit electrical energy, and it also acts as an electromagnetic shunt. So as a result, we now expose the gas to an electromagnetic field, and now you'll have an electromagnetic alignment, as you see here, that will extend beyond the non-magnetic tube, which transverses the coil to produce electrical energy. This gas, because of its interlocking between the covalent link-up as well as its electromagnetic link-up, gives us the ability now to move discrete magnetic flux lines into tubular pathway, the closed-loop tubular pathway, by which those magnetic links remain intact and in the proper position. We can move the gas by an example of a non-magnetic turbine wheel hooked to, for example, a, a small electric motor. It only takes several torque ounces to move the gas as opposed to the prior art of moving it in many, many horsepower. As a result of that, we can move the gas in several torque ounces. Now, there's an example of using a non-magnetic turbine that moves the gas to a non-magnetic material, which is copper tubing in this particular case. And as that magnetic field moves through the pickup coils, you're now generating electrical energy and in a very efficient and economic way. We now took the technology further and replaced the mechanic pump with a electromagnetic pump to move the gas without any mechanical moving parts. Basically what happens is the first coil produces an electromagnetic field that locks onto the gas and then we deflect the electromagnetic field in a linear direction and as a result is now moving the gas without any mechanical displacement. We're doing some unique things on oscillating the magnetic fields in order to achieve maximum efficiency of the generators. This is an example of an electromagnetic pump, EPG electrical generator. Gentlemen, where's the bearing? Where are the contact brushes? If I have a magnetized gas inside the tubular structure way, is that gas basically going to wear out Now we're confronted with accelerating the process to the Star Wars level. We are now injecting laser energy into the gas, and we're allowing the laser energy to be absorbed by the nucleus of the gas, which in turn allow the electrons of the gas to move farther away from its <coughs> nucleus, therefore increase its spin. And under the electromagnetic theory of magnetism, that whenever an electrically charged particle passes through an electric static field, Something's got to happen in the law of physics, and what takes place is an increase in electromagnetic field. So therefore, we are now moving the magnetic field close to the speed of light because the non-magnetic tube is now being converted into a light guide, and the laser energy is no longer being dissipated outside of the light guide. It's being reflected much like that of fiber optics. If we want to compound the electromagnetic field, we simply will hit the gas at a burst of 10 watts of laser energy, and as the 
the laser energy passes through the gas and goes back to the original point, we now allow the laser to laze again, and we are now superimposing more laser energy on the process. So as a result, we're now moving a greater intensity magnetic field, and we go around and do the same thing again, and in a re very short period of time, you are now moving a fantastic electromagnetic field of tremendous high intensity. Now heretofore, as been mentioned in many of the symposium on free energy devices, one of the inherent drawbacks of that type of technology was that you must increase the magnetic field of the permanent magnets. But when you had, when to increase the magnetic field, you had to increase mass. This technology allows us to amplify the electromagnetic fields at many magnitudes without increase, increasing mass, so therefore gave us the ability to overcome the limits of the prior state of the art. This is an example of the laser energy being absorbed by the nucleus causing the electrons to go to a higher energy state. And when that occurs, as it migrates from the nucleus, the electron spin increases, and when it increases, you're now increasing the, its electromagnetic fields. Now, we have many other ways to produce the electrical energy from the fuel cell because we are now disconnecting the umbilical cords. The first section of the gas actuated can be used where you can use a Stirling engine to heat the gas to oscillate a magnet, which in turn would produce electrical energy, and you could feed it back through the grid system to the voltage intensifier circuit to restrict the amps and allow voltage to take over. Second area, we can replace the electromagnetic pump or the non-magnetic turbine wheel with an internal combusted engine. But in those two cases, the hydrogen and oxygen atoms are being consumed in the process. Can we now produce electrical energy without consuming the hydrogen and oxygen atoms? And as a result, the next two areas were developed to accomplish the task. Inherently, as you're releasing the gas from water, it produces as a byproduct gas pressure, does it not? And as a result of releasing that gas, you now can allow as the gas goes through to up or to the nozzle, if you put a turbine wheel and subject it to the gas pressure being escaping, you will turn the turbine wheel with hooks to a second turbine wheel to move the magnetized gas to produce the electrical energy. Now, gentlemen, we're producing electrical energy bypassing thermal chemical interreaction and nuclear interreaction. The only thing I'm using is gas pressure to generate electrical energy and I'm now producing electrical energy without consuming the fuel source. Another development was called the gas battery or the electrical polarization generator by which we are inherently destabilizing the oxygen atom. We are pulling off its electrons, which now takes on a positive electrical charge. We now can direct those positive electrical charges into uh, electrically insulated cavity expose it to electrical conductive plates like stainless steel 304 material. And we know in physics that when electrically charged particles are exposed to electrical conductive plates, it now becomes positive electrical charge, does it not? And we simply link those electrically charged plates to a terminal, and therefore the terminal becomes positive electrically charged. And we know in physics that anything and differential of anything will perform work. And since we have a positive electrical potential, we now can hook it to ground through load, and we can cause the negative charge electrons to migrate up to the oxygen atoms on the plates, and as a result, now produce electrical energy, bypassing all mechanical applications. For an example of this is what happens if we would take one billion oxygen atoms that had four missing electrons, how many electrons could migrate to the plates? Well, it would be four billion electrons, would it not? So as the generator is producing the gas, we are now also generating electrical energy simultaneously in the process, and we can accomplish the task in five different ways. So the process is a self-sustaining oscillation system that once you excite it from an external source, it maintains itself as long as there is water in the fuel cell. Now there's an example of the EPG system now hooked up. That is a composite design of the water fuel cell technology. It was been developed under the principle that, number one, it had that the same engineering design specification in one system would apply to all systems. We have accomplished that to minimize the expenditure in uh, production and distribution. 
For those who would like to seek additional information, you can contact Water Fuel Cell at 3792 Broadway. If you have a pen, you can copy it down. We'd be more than happy to... Yes. Or, and as I said it a little earlier, you can contact Ike, and he'd be more than happy to uh, get the information or the name and address to me, and I'll send you the information, or he'll send it to you. I now have a little videotape that I'd like you to see, uh, that dune buggy running off of water. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me get that.